I'm Mitchell Froome. And I'm Chad Blake. And we're talking to you from La Fabrique in the south of France. Uh, we're in the middle of a, a seminar that we're doing uh, for 15 participants. And, uh, and this is just a bit extra to answer questions from the world out there. So we have 10 questions. And it's the first time we've worked together in 14 years. 14 years. So it's a great occasion. First question, do you want me to read it? Yeah. Uh, Steve McClintock, Chad, I love how the Arctic Monkeys AM and Black Keys El Camino have such a full bottom end, like a hip hop record. Can you share any tips or techniques for achieving that nice full bass and kick? Cheers. That's pretty easy. Um, both these bands came uh, to me saying exactly that. They, uh, they wanted to, a live band feel, but to have some sonics that uh, reflect the modern sound of hip hop records. Um, so I added a sample, and I'm pretty sure I used um, the samples that are on. Um, this Drumagog is the sampler that I have, and there's a there's two samples that I use a lot, and that's Techno 15 and Techno Number no. Five, uh, and you just have to play with the tuning. The EQ and the phase, uh, some maybe high pass filtering to just, it's just got to fit with the rest of the drum kit and the bass. So play around with that and you should get it. Exactly that. Your turn. Okay, Pete Pelisante, what are the new tools that you've discovered in the last five years that made the biggest change in your productions? New keyboards, softwares. The thing that's made the biggest change in my production is something that was a new tool for me, which is Pro Tools. I, 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 I kind of avoided learning it, and I found myself doing, needing to do more and more arrangements, full band arrangements, strings, horns, everything. So past three years, I've been writing a lot of music, a lot of tracks, w working with artists that way, and also delivering full arrangements on Pro Tools. And, New keyboards, I just got one I love. It's called an OP-1. I brought it here. Everybody seemed to like it. It's a great keyboard. Really? And every, it's one of these ones everyone will use in their own way. So uh, you can sample off FM radio. You can uh, mangle sounds in a lot of different ways. You can sample your own keyboards or guitars or whatever. It's, it's a great thing. And it's got cranks and rubber bands. That's, yeah, it's got everything you want. And it's cool. tiny, but it's solid. It's a great, great keyboard great instrument and a, and a thing called a pocket piano that it's just fun I, I haven't used it a lot on recording but it's uh, just a little 8-bit analog synth and these are the first the OP1 and this are the first new keyboard things that I've found maybe in 15 years that I like so Mikey Cooling I frequently record vocalists guitarists trying to separate the vocals and guitar from a take is tricky, especially if I want to apply pitch correction. Any tips? Also, keeping the hat off the snare tracks. That it is a really, you know, age-old uh, engineering problems. Um, uh, besides the obvious of just doing things separately, uh, which with I don't do a lot of um, pitch correction on vocals myself. So, um, I mean, I. If, if it was going to be a lot, I'd I'd record them separately. But if you can't, um, for the like acoustic guitars and and vocals, it's just finding a mic that really rejects the acoustic. And there are there's a Neumann. I'm sorry, I can't remember the the model number. Um, but it looks like a pencil mic with a larger head, like a KU86 or something like that. It's it's so it's not the greatest vocal mic sound, but you can work with it, and it really, it, you have a, the guitar here and the vocalist up here, and you just almost don't hear the guitar at all. The other thing is um, using a lavalier mic, uh, which um, we did a lot, all, all the records that we did back in the 90s, um, would have, the, if it was acoustic guitar, it would have been recorded this way, as putting a little lavalier, back then it would have been an ECM-50, a Sony ECM-50 or an ECM-55, putting it as an omni lavalier condenser that would um, put it inside the sound hole, just hanging slightly inside the sound hole, 
roll off all the low end, add a little bit of sans amp, and you know, really virtually no leakage um, of vocal into the guitar. Uh, then you just got to find yourself a good vocal mic. Um, as far as the hi hat, uh, my only tip: I've never found anything that worked for me, except uh, that worked as good as having a, a set of hi hats around that are quiet. Just find yourself a really good pair of hi hats that sound good uh, and that are quiet. You can you can find them; they're half the level of these K's. Or um, a lot of drummers come in with hi hats that that are for live and they're just really meant to project. Um, find something else. Or uh, I would say this: yeah, just get the balance right. Have the drummer play it quieter. There's nothing that sounds better than a balanced drummer. Yeah. So if it's and I think you just fight it all the way to the end if you don't get a balanced kit. Yeah. So make the decision of how loud you want stuff and have the person play like that. Yeah. That's Some drummers will get thrown by that, and in that case, get the quieter <laughs> the, Yeah, the quieter but, if hands, but, if but also if they're thrown by that, just give them a chance, and, yeah. and they'll learn how to play in the studio. You know, that's... Yeah. Yeah, it's actually that you're right. That's the only way they're going to learn, isn't it? Yeah. You know, it's by... We've had... I remember some guys that played the hi-hat too quiet. Yeah, you know, for my taste, it, I, it, he, a guy can play a balance yeah. and and just encourage him not to all of a sudden start bashing it, you know. So, just play balance the yeah. track. Yeah, I, I think uh, as an engineer, it's not always your job to like think that you can do the impossible. I think it's okay to ask vocalists when they're singing to work the mic. People don't do that much anymore. Um, uh, drummers can work the kit and work the mic themselves. You can find ways to do that. So uh, I, I think it'd be really good to maybe put some heat on on uh, the signal coming in. You know. Yeah, and, and if they record a take of the drummer, have them come in, listen, say, well, this here's yeah. just a mic overhead. Listen how loud your hi-hat is, or listen how loud your snare is. Like, could you please play balance and try to give them their headphones so it sounds like they should sound? And Yeah, I, I think that's good. Andrew Todd's. Can you name three records that changed the game in terms of production and sonics in the last decade? I just, I, I don't have an answer for that, except just I, I think some people are original and I like them, but I, I think everything's so diffuse now that uh, there's just these pockets of people that like certain artists, so it doesn't seem like, there hasn't been the new Beatles or anything, so no. I don't know if, you know, maybe there's some records you've heard that you really like, or but n yeah. not. I don't know about Game Changer that I would point to. I I remember like some people thought Feist record, the remind remainder or reminder, or whatever it's right. called, that that was it changed the way a, a bunch of female artists looked at at how to do music. You know, there's records that different people have admired. I'm sure the hip hop records. You you know th that there's yeah. guys that. There's lots of stuff that I like and that you know I, I, I love to listen to it at home. I think I'd have to go back farther than the last decade for a game changer for me. I think w when I think of a game changer for me in that in modern recording, I'm, I think of Super Duper Fly, Missy Misdemeanor Elliot. Or that, like you were saying, record. Or Voodoo, you know, De yeah, De Voodoo, D'Angelo, Voodoo. We just changed the whole way people played it. But really, it was yeah. Super Duper Fly that did it for me. I, yeah. When I got that record and played it, because we were still at the Sound Factory, I just remember playing that there and, and just, uh, it, it was so beautiful. I just think that's, a, it's about as close to a perfect record um, that you can get. Uh, just the, between production and sonics and what the artist is, um, you know, the, the identity of the arts is just fantastic. Next. John Smith, Chad, on the Finn Brothers album, there's a track where the vocals appear to be elevated above or on top of the mix. Was this the use of the KU-100 mic? Um, the KU-100, for those who don't know, is a binaural microphone. Some people call it a dummy head. Uh, it was designed by a guy named Fritz Kunzkoff, and it's um, supposed to give you like um, a realistic representation of a of a binaural field, which is just a binaural is how we hear, how humans hear. And um, I don't remember doing vocals 
on any particular song, but it, it, there is, I think there is a track on there I recorded almost the whole thing with the binaural head and then added some stuff, but um, so it, it could be. Uh, the thing about being on top of the mix, I'm not sure I understand what that means and where that would be. Do you mean literally on top? Because that's easy. Anything mono, to my ears, anything mono on headphones goes to the top. Um, whether it's binaural or not, the hard part, the tricky bit, is to get something to sound like it's in front or behind. And that's where binaural, you try to, that's what you try to work with binaural. But isn't so, that somewhat level? Like, if, if the vocal level isn't real hot, it sounds more on top. If it's really loud, it sounds in front. If you're talking, if he's talking about on top of the mix, then level-wise, and that's level, but because he's mentioning binaural, I'm, right. I'm thinking on top or in front, because, right. yeah, on. something on top of the mix is level, would be level. Um, yeah. So I'm not sure I understand the question entirely, but the short answer is, I don't remember. Sorry. Daryl Swart. Uh, love your work. Can you explain your basic mixing setup for the Cheryl Crow record? Maybe focus on one song in particular. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's simple. It is going back a way, so I don't remember exactly what the setup was, but at that time, I th if you're asking about like what was on the stereo bus, maybe what effects we used, um, the vocal chain. I'm not going to remember specifics. Uh, stereo bus at that time was a Al Smart C1. That was Mitchell's compressor um, that we had, a uh, limiter. Um, the, I was using Sans amps mixed in for bass and maybe kick drum, bits of the drums. At that time, I wasn't using level lock on the drums. Was like, that would no. have been... Um, it was just an API console, mm -hmm. it was a sound pack. I, I used to use um, a guitar pedal, a DOD analog delay, a lot for vocals, uh, for very short vocals. Um, what was that? There was that one song called The Book that we used this Morley pedal. I remember that. It's the only specific I remember is using this oil can delay to get the sound of the acoustic guitars at the front. They're all warbly and... But you recorded that. That wasn't a... Oh, no, that was part of a mix move. I think it was part move. of a mix and maybe yeah. recorded it while we were mixing. But yeah. I, I'm sorry I can't be more helpful on that. I, um, it was very simple. It was just a, a 48 input API desk, really, with a, an Al Smart limiter. 24 track tape? 24 track tape. Mixed. Oh, we mixed that to Sadie. Right. 16 bit 441. Clifton Cox. Uh, hey, Chad. First off, thanks for taking the time to answer questions for those of us who constantly love to learn. Me too. Uh, on the Black Keys Brothers album, it said that they gave you a simple kick and mono overhead track. I've been wondering for years how you got that mono overhead to sound so big, wide, and natural. Is it a stereo width tool, reverb, tight delays? I can't put my hand on it, but whatever it is, it sounds great. Thanks. Um, the, every song, I think, is a bit different, but mainly if you hear a spread on there to stereo, it's probably speakerphone. And I don't remember what patch was used or what, what IR was used, but it, I, I used Carl's living room. I've used the bathroom. There's a white tiled bathroom. There's a thing called an uh, atelier, atelier. I don't know what it is. Is that French? Victor might know. Um, uh, what else? There, there was another... Anyway, it, it, oh, girl's bedroom was another one. Um, so yeah, speakerphone. Uh, also used um, uh, H3000 patches. Really, all really small stuff. But maybe the, the best uh, bit is any of those things, I probably would have rolled off all the top end, just so it sounded dull. I, I do that a lot for reverbs and rooms. 5k and up just pull it down just uh you know maybe not a, a really sharp slope but like 12 db per octave shelved 5k or 8k just gone and it sounds really nice and warm mauricio mendez 
Yeah, hey Mitchell and Chad, I love the sound of your records. That's how I got to know you. I noticed my favorite records were made by you. Thank you. Can you tell me some strange or weird recording techniques you've come across or invented yourself? Like the amp going in an aluminum hose and recording that sound. That's a good idea. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. I love your work and creativity. Well, I think that's, I mean, that's on the engineering end, which, which um, yeah, uh, we were like-minded in that, is that anything we could do to change the sound. Um, uh, I, I learned from a guy named Sherman Kane who used to talk about the plumbing of a microphone, and um, I took it kind of literally, uh, saying that all microphones were omni and... Um, that you, there was electronic things and mechanical things that happened to make, to turn a microphone into a cardioid or uh, uh, bi-directional. Or, um, so I started doing that myself with Omni microphones is, is taking cans and pipes and putting them in, trying to change the EQ curve of the mic and the get a oh, di different weird polar pattern. So that's where that comes from. It's using anything. So it's just unlimited. But I think... Um, Unusual, what I remember Mitchell doing in unusual techniques was was putting together lots of really different instruments, like you'd have a keyboard part that you'd, you'd want a note out of, but then you'd get like a marxophone and add that to it, but then want that really filtered, and then that was almost it, and then you'd go out and do, I don't know, a percussive bass note on the B3, and then that was all mixed together to create one kind of sound and sometimes it could just be a stab like a well, that's a george george martin like uh that's orchestral where you combine a few instruments to create one instrument and when people double it's better to try it in octaves or fifths or like create overtones from something but i would if i was going to suggest something for example we entered a period where i remember we whenever we recorded drums we tried to change up the drum kit like instead of the hi-hat, set this up. Instead of the snare, you put some jangles on it. Or just, and then Chad would experiment with different kinds of miking, distortion. And then eventually that would affect the way the drummer played. So if you want to find weird techniques, I would try to... I think it's much easier to come upon something if you start with something unusual, say and then see how strange and see if in the process of all of it if you can come up with something if you just mixing and you have a straight drum kit it's harder i mean you can do stuff but it's not going to sound all that different it really needs it's really good to start from the top because it changes everything the way in everybody terms plays. of coming on to techniques yeah. you know you go like oh i see how we do that with drums but there can never be a hi-hat you know but you won't figure that out if you get a drum kit that you're trying to mix it's already got all that stuff yeah. in it so yeah i think that's probably how a lot of stuff came about it was like a circular we like set up, the drummer would start to play something then we'd change the kit around and what if we did this and then you'd be working on stuff and he'd be getting your ideas from and then he would start to play differently and then eventually a really good groove would start to come yeah. out of it so yeah. it's uh, if you can i would suggest it this is Kalsey Smith. Mitchell, Chad, how did you manage to keep a collaboration going for so long? How did you share the credits? Wasn't there times when one felt he had contributed more to the record than the other? How should one manage those feelings after long days on projects? Uh, I think it comes down to one essential point. Music, whether you, whether you choose to accept this idea or not, Music has a requirement, which is a generous spirit. And uh, some people are greedy. Some people worry about these things. Uh, in my case, I felt that as soon as Chad and I had been working about three or four years, and I think it was after Kiko, people started asking me to work with them, but they were saying, well, we want Chad. We want to make sure that we have Chad. As soon as that happened, I felt, okay, now we're a partnership. And so I just told Chad, hey, you, we're producing this together now. And one of the reasons why I did is because Chad never asked. And uh, so we never had, there was never an issue. It was like, he was being generous with me. I tried to be generous with him. And, and we just, 
our collaboration changed. I remember there were periods where arrangements seemed important, and then there was periods where for a while arrangements seemed unimportant, and it was more about sound. So there was, I felt there was records where Chad had probably contributed more than I had. What I had to offer wasn't really sought, you know, the full degree of what I had to offer wasn't really sought out. So, but it didn't matter, like, who cares? I mean, I, you know, I've done, worked on records where I've gotten zero credit, or it, it's, it's just about trying to be generous with people, and it all works out for you. I, I, I never thought about it. Um, we, we got on from the beginning, and I don't remember a time where we didn't. Um, you know, it was, uh, it was a real great collaboration. I, I just remember you saying, I remember you, I mean, a lot of, uh, engineers may want, they may say, I really want to move into production, so I need production credit or else I'm leaving. Mm -hmm. And uh, you never asked, you never cared, you told me you really didn't want to produce, and then you were like a reluctant producer. Bands yeah. started, they were attracted to the sound of the records that we did, and s a lot of bands don't want a producer in the room, so J Chad started doing it, but kind of reluctantly. So uh, may maybe that was part of it, that it, we, we weren't like clawing and scratching our way up the ladder no. or... We just well, I wasn't to, offended that you know we just wanted to make good records. Yeah, that's all we wanted to do. Um, so don't worry about yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> just just keep going it. and and like try to be generous with people. If, if you work with an artist who says I really want to be co-producer, you say, well, I'm doing my job. But if you want, if it's important for you to have your name on there, go ahead, do it. Uh, and if people see the record and they see you produced it with the artist, they're gonna look think that you're the producer anyway. You know that. In general, I. D you just don't worry about it. Yeah. So, I'll be quiet now. Nick Hosford. Hi guys, you both deserve a pat on the back and a free round. Well, we'll hold you to it. Yeah, Nick. from whom? Yeah. Um, aside from that, do you have any advice for a new studio and engineers to get higher end projects? Ooh, coming in. Assuming the quality is there, like as I am sure it's always been with both of you, how did you move up the ladder to work with more serious artists with bigger budgets and aspirations? Besides word of mouth, which is quite powerful. I think it was word of mouth. That's, yeah. there, isn't, there isn't a besides on that. We were lucky early on. We, the, the way you move up that, that ladder, if you're looking at it as a ladder, is if you have a successful record. Yeah. And, uh, or one that people talk about. And, and that in my mind, if you have an underground record that people talk about and doesn't sell very much, that's as powerful as a hit record. The record, I think, I mean, we did a Latin Playboys record that nobody ever even knew about, but that brought in more stuff uh, that's in my career than anything else. It still is mentioned for It's me. word of mouth, and people yeah. like it, and they like the fact that we worked on it. So, yeah, yeah, there's, yeah there's, there's no answer, except if it's a new studio, if there's groups you admire, I'm, I mean, maybe you could offer them to come in for a free day or something and just try to do great work for them or, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know. Yeah. I, just Ours was just one way, so uh, and that's all we know, really. I, yeah, we didn't take meetings with labels. We, we didn't, didn't network. We didn't network. We didn't do meetings. We, we didn't. had no aggressive management ever. Um, like no meetings were taken on our behalf. And I don't. I, the aggressive management thing wasn't really on purpose, was it? But then it it became on purpose. We yeah. we did end up deciding we didn't want anybody to go after gigs for us. We wanted musicians, um, you know, artists to contact us because they wanted us, not because a label. <laughs> which wouldn't happen, a label, God forbid, one thing else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but we never played that game. And yeah. the people that are good at that game do it. But we, we just, I never felt like I, that was my strong suit, so. Um. Yeah. Cheers. That's it. Thank you. Bye. 99.